So, hello everybody. It is my great pleasure to express our warm welcome to our fourth HHL Expert Talk. I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight and I hope you've all been having a wonderful week. So what is the HHL Expert Talk and why are we doing this? The HHL Expert Talk is a virtual talk series with which HHL aims to address latest key topics in research to broaden the knowledge transfer on current social, economic and political topics led by HHL experts. To briefly introduce myself, first of all, my name is Sigrid Fischer and I'm delighted to be moderating the HHL Expert Talk Series. I studied journalism and psychology at Indiana University in US and continued with a Master's of Science and Performance Psychology at the University of Edinburgh in the UK, where I also worked later on in my career. At HHL, I'm responsible for the HHL Alumni Network. Before we're heading into tonight's talk, I would like to give you a brief overview of HHL's facts and figures. HHL was established more than 120, 120 years ago in Leipzig, Germany. It is our mission to educate entrepreneurial responsible and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research and practice. We're driven by excellence to benefit our students, stakeholders and society. So where are we today? Today, we have more than 700 students within our five programs, and these five programs are the full-time and part-time Masters of Science in Management, the full-time and part-time MBA, and our PhD program. We're excited to have more than 60 nationalities on our campus and to have a very strong network of more than 2,700 alumni in 10 chapters. As an entrepreneurial-minded university, we're especially excited to have more than 300 startups founded or co-founded by HHL alumni. And five of these are actually unicorns, so privately held startup companies with a value of more than 1 billion US dollars. We're also very excited to have strong bonds to more than 130 partner universities. So I'm now delighted to introduce our two speakers for tonight. First, our HHL expert, Professor Dr. Manfred Kirchgeorg. Professor Kirchgeorg holds the Chair of Marketing Management at HHL. His research focuses on sustainable marketing, holistic branding, and life and virtual communication. He is an associate member of the advisory boards of several organizations, a part of the supervisory board of the Unilever Deutschland Holding, and part of the executive board of the CEO network, Wissenschaftliche Gesellschaft für Marktorientierte Unternehmensführung. He's also the founder of the scientific transfer platform Mission to Impact. In 2015, Professor Kurt Georg conducted research abroad in the Silicon Valley. There, he had the opportunity to meet and exchange ideas with various founders, and amongst these was also Stefan Koschel, with which he started a lasting collaboration. And that leads me to our second expert for tonight, our US expert, Stefan Koschel. Stefan was born and raised in Halle, Germany, and is now home in the Silicon Valley. Over the past 25 years, he has developed machine learning solutions for some of the most complex business environments. Over the past decade, he has helped companies around the world to tap undreamt of efficiency potentials through big data analytics. But Stefan saw a shift in customer demand from business intelligence to business automation and in new technologies from large data to artificial intelligence. Therefore, in 2017, he founded a new company called Automation Hero which is also developing very, very successful. I'm now handing over to Professor Kirch Georg and Stefan Kroschuk, who will be elaborating on post-corona phase as a business challenge, exciting insights of a hidden champion from Silicon Valley. Subsequently to their talk, we will have a Q&A. And for this, I would like to ask everybody to type in their questions in our chat, as we would like to keep everybody muted to have our talk running very smoothly. So enjoy tonight. Yes, okay, Mrs. Fisher, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. And uh, first of all, uh, I, I'd like to welcome all of our guests, which will follow this talk here. It's a pleasure for me and I've seen uh, in, in the list that there are a lot of alumni students. So um, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. And um, Mrs. Fisher, you have just to um, skip the presentation. Um, nice. Thank you very much. And um, 
Ja, uh, Stefan Gruschow, Stefan, um, you are here, but really you are not here because you are far away, you are in Silicon Valley, and I, I think you have a nice view on the, on the San Francisco Bay. How is the weather in Silicon Valley? It's uh, nice and warm. The clouds are slowly coming over the San Francisco hills. Um, yeah, but um, I, I'm expecting a very hot day, as you, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's early in the morning. And um, Stefan, it's wonderful to have you here in, in, in this talk. And um, let me start with a short story, with a short story from my side. It was 2013. And we had an event in Leipzig and I was looking for an expert on big data. And uh, I thought we have maybe to look at someone from Silicon Valley. So I talked to, uh, at that time, Rainer Hildebrandt. He was a board member of the Otto Group. And um, uh, to, to see and to ask him if he knew anybody. And then he was thinking a minute and then he said, why would you not invite the guy from Halle? Uh, I, I was surprised, Halle, <laughs> big data analytics. And, and, and I was also skeptical. And he said, there's Stefan Goshoff. He's a great guy. And, and, and why do you not invite him? So Stefan, at that time, we, uh, um, I, I, I contacted you. And, and so since that time we, 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 um, we meet uh, and we have had some uh, interesting events. And um, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting that someone from Halle is, uh, is uh, a big data veteran and a serial entrepreneur uh, with his roots in the, in the open source uh, community. And, um, and Stefan, um, I think we, we might talk about uh, three up to four topics. First of all, let's a, bit, a little bit look at the start, at, at, at your beginning. And, and, and then we, we should move on and, and, and maybe uh, a first insight from, 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 from your expertise, what's going on in Silicon Valley and, and is there an impact on, um, on, on Corona crisis pandemic? On, on, on Silicon Valley, on the companies and so on. And then we might reflect uh, um, what is your expectation? How will companies in the digital world or in the traditional world be affected and what should they do? And then finally, maybe we will come up with some recommendation to especially startups. Um, Stefan, um, I would like to take a quote from the Brand 1 magazine. And uh, 2011, there was a story of four pages about Stefan Groschow. And um, let, let, let me come up with one quote. So Groschow's story, however, reads like a fairy tale. The short version is a young computer nerd from East German province, Halle, <laughs> found a small company. Technically, the company was well positioned, but commercially, he was not clever. So let me stop here. It's, uh, the, 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 there is an additional quote. Stefan, um, you are from Halle. And, and um, when have you started or, or when, when got you interested in, in the phenomenon of, of big data and of, of, of programming uh, software? Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it kind of weaves to my whole life. It, it really starts with, um, as, a, as a kid, my uncle in East Germany, where you historically didn't have access to Things such computers uh, actually did had a Russian Commodore clone in his uh, in his company, mm -hmm. and uh, when I um, when I always when I visited him, he's like, okay, well we can go there and we can play computer games, but of course the Russian Commodore clone didn't have a floppy disk, right? So if you wanted to play a game, 
okay, here's the here's a five page printout basic code that you have to type if you want to play Pong. So I learned coding as a kid. Um, yeah, if, if I wanted to play, I had to code the game. You know, and if you do it often enough, then you kind of, you know, you, you learn this, right? So I learned um, interacting with the machine very early. I was very lucky then to, um, you know, let's call it talk my parents into um, not just getting me a computer, but also very, very early getting a modem long before there was like what we call internet today. Yeah. Um, my parents were always surprised why our phone bill was that high, right? Um, but basically, um, you know, that's kind of how I started uh, exploring the world outside of the small, um, small town, what I've caused dearly love. Have you, have you studied? Have you, have you studied uh, um, IT or computer science or something like this? So I actually during high school, or excuse me, during Abitur in Germany, um, already programmed a search engine for the university library of, um, of University Halle. Um, mm -hmm. And the IT director back then is like, okay, so this is 95, 96, right? So that's kind of the first steps of the, of, of the internet coming coming uh, to Halle then. Um, and he basically said, look, I mean, um, congratulations for your Abitur. We really need to get the project finished. Be happy to pay you. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, let me think about this. Should I do civil service or continue doing what I love? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I managed for seven years to kind of sneak around my military service, basically. Yeah. Um, and of course, meanwhile, the company grew and grew. So right out of, um, right out of uh, gymnasium, I started my very first company. And I actually did a um, startup seminar, Existenz Gründer Lehrgang, with yeah. the, with the um, IHK in Halle. And of course, you know, when I showed up with 18 years, um, they all smiled at me. It's like, seriously, yeah, you want to start a company? What are you doing, right? And of course, meanwhile, everybody's like, oh yeah, I'm opening a restaurant. That's a real business. And I'm opening a massage service. This is a real business. Yeah. This computer stuff, come on, you're just playing games, right? Yeah, um, um, yeah so it, it's, uh, it was very interesting. We did very exciting stuff very early. So late 90s, we did text classification and clustering. Um, Hoffman, LaRoche, Pfizer, we are some of the early customers in Europe, uh, the German, um, um, uh, environment department was a customer mm -hmm. uh, uh, as the European Union, but it wasn't really a viable business um, because you know I never had an, um, the opportunity to, to really make an MBA. You know I should have studied at HHL, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so so I really had to learn from um, you know from zero how to build a business, run a business. And, yeah. um, you know, now, um, almost 30 years later, I, I really like, uh, I, I'm glad I had the breadth of experience, right? I had to do my own marketing, I had to do my own sales, I had to set up my own ad campaigns, um, yeah. I had to do my own financial management, uh, accounting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that, of course, now um, proves very helpful if you run a big business and you can uh, on a regular basis, still still surprise your your colleagues if you look over the account and say like, wait, is that the right account you booked this in? And like, how do you know? So um, anyhow, I learned by doing, yeah. And um, there was of course a lot of blood and sweat that um, was necessary to invest, but um, it worked out okay for me. Stefan, um, uh, going back to the late '90s and 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 then 2000, um, you were still in Halle, right? Yeah. You were in Halle, and um, uh, what you can see in articles in, 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 in the press that um, you were a part of, um, of uh, a group, open source, um, um, uh, a group of open source software. So, um, what, what was this? What was this? Uh, how, uh, how come that you, you were a member of, of this group which developed an open source software? Yeah, so as I as I tried to say before, I was part of kind of in general the the, the digital sub community, right? Um, Subculture, if you will. Um, yeah. Early on, exploring uh, computers that were connected to a telephone and see how you 
uh, what you can do with that. And then later, of course, very fascinating was um, uh, the rise of open source software that I was then uh, very active in that community. So I was very early in um, a technology called Eclipse that was a um, software development environment and in a technology called JBoss that later sold, I think, for 900 million to Red Hat. Um, but I guess my my street cred really in that community comes from being one of the three co-founders of this uh, technology called Hadoop, yeah. what was um, basically the foundational technology that started this whole big data movement. Uh, it was a very traumatic technology change that allowed at a fraction of the cost to store and analyze uh, much, much more data. Historically, that was a very exclusive um, um, you know, process, only the really big companies could afford to put the big Oracle and Teradata databases uh, in there and better understand customer engagement or internal processes or anything like that. And um, as always, you know, um, so more slows, so hardware gets faster and faster. Um, and meanwhile, you can solve some of these problems that historically have been, you know, solved with hardware or very specialized tools, you can solve them with software. And, right. and in general, you know, there's a, there's a quote from um, the founder of Andres Norwitz, which says, um, software eats the world, right? And if you really think about that, more and more things are virtualized and becoming software. So we basically built, you know, in quotes, um, a highly distributed database in software that historically had required massive hardware. And with that, really started that big data movement. And, you know, that's... Um, can I just can I just ask a question? Hadoop, the uh -huh. the initials Hadoop. Uh, why is there a story behind this Hadoop? The initials or the name of of this software, which is very well known in, in Silicon Valley. I have uh, when I visited Silicon Valley and I, I spoke with a lot of startups and Horson Works and 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 you know all these companies, um, they have had a lot of respect. Um, when, when I said, wow, Hadoop is, is, is some kind of software, and, and they were, wow, yes, uh, and there's a guy of Stefan Gushov, so they know your name, and, and what, the initials, is there a story behind this? Well, the, um, this, so we were three guys, right, the Polish guy, an American, in me, and the American guy is, is basically the poster boy, as so many times, um, and um, the simple story is he asked his I think back then, four years old son, how, how the software should be called. And he had an elephant toy and he said, like my elephant toy, which he called Hadoop. So uh, that's the whole story behind it. There's not much more. But what was interesting in the context of uh, Halle is that uh, designer of the logo, a very dear friend, Thomas, um, who is, um, you know, a street artist in Halle actually did, uh, did the logo that you know, later, uh, again, from street art in Halle to being on IBM's and SAP's big website on the big conferences, you know, it turned into a multi-billion dollar business and, and uh, visual right. representation, of course, was born in Halle again. Right. So, so how come that you moved from Halle mm -hmm. uh, to, to the US and, 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 and to Silicon Valley? So, so, so uh, can you just say, uh, what, what, what was the story behind this? Yeah, so um, it was just really hard in the late 90s, early 2000s to build a high-tech business in Germany, right? So there was no capital available. I remember um, very vividly going to um, going to a bank in Halle, uh, the bank might name, stay unnamed, but uh, and saying like, we have this great technology and look, and, and, and all these companies are already using it and we want to build out the business now. And they basically looked at me as like, well, you need money. Your parents have a house. Why don't they sell it? <laughs> so, um, you know, my, my life is full of contrasts, right? So this was the experience in, in, in East Germany where there was a, where actually a lot of stigma, right? If you, even if you went to the companies in, in other parts of Germany, they're like, I literally had people asking me if we had phones um, on the east side of Germany still at that time, right? So, mm -hmm. you know. So um, the other side was that um, we had a very hard time selling in Germany. Meanwhile, you know, around 2005, we only had customers in the US and mostly Silicon Valley. So I moved um, to Silicon Valley 2005, 2006. Our second customer was Apple. 
I actually built um, with um, like around 10 people in Halle Amazale Saale, the iPhone backend in 2006 uh, mm -hmm. for Steve Jobs. Yeah, we did uh, all the um, behavior analytics, drop calls, crash lock analytics, etc. cetera. Um, and again, this is the contrast, right? So here, uh, nobody wants to buy your stuff because you are a tiny company from Halle and they, moment, the moment they hear you're not from IBM, Oracle, mm -hmm. Microsoft, they close the door on you. Meanwhile, in Silicon Valley, you know, <coughs> I, I barely spoke English. I really had a hard time. I did not um, study English in school, but Russian. So I showed up with totally broken English, mostly from like action movies I saw, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, and yeah, here here I was building building the iPhone back, and and after that uh, things just accelerated. We worked for AT T, Verizon, Nokia. Um, we built it um, predictive algorithms for EMI music. Uh, 2008. Uh, you know, if you if you're in your late 20s and your algorithm says, "Oh, Katy Perry is the next thing," and then you know, six months later, she's a she's a pop star, walks into the office, you're like, "My algorithm predicted that." That was there was some 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 good experience, right? Um, so, uh, and then even to increase the contrast, you know, 2009, we basically converted our German company with a US office to a US company with a German office and actually with 16 pages PowerPoint presentation, um, actually keynote, yeah, not necessarily PowerPoint. Um, um, we got two and a half million dollars in venture funding. Um, what was for me, you know, unreal uh, 2009. Meanwhile, you know, it's uh, almost 10 years later, I raised over 150 million dollars in venture capital. Right impossible in Germany. Yeah? So the, the scene got better, uh, the venture scene obviously and the startup scene, um, but uh, it is a completely different game to raise capital in Silicon Valley than it is uh, in, um, in Germany. Right. Yeah, Stefan, I, I, I think it's unbelievable uh, to, to hear this, this, this story and um, and and again, your name is very well known in Silicon Valley, and and you are one uh, uh, one guy from from this uh, Hadoop group or or um, uh, this this open source group, and 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 so your name stands also for one of these inventors. Um, uh, then you built uh, you built the name uh, the the company Data Data Mare. And um, how many companies have you built during the last? Uh, because now you have another company, which is uh, it's very interesting. And maybe you should uh, let us know. So um, why have you founded now this company? And, and, and what, what are you doing now? Yeah. How many companies um, have you founded? So this is my seventh company. I, of course, question beyond a few. Yeah. Um, so uh, the... Uh, Again, learning by experience, and you need to make mistakes to, uh, you know, again to get the experience, right? Um, yeah. But I, again, I was lucky. I had the chance to sell a couple of companies. Uh, my last company before uh, is out there doing well. Um, yeah. So automation hero um, yeah, is is very exciting. So um, look, Hadoop is. At this point, um, legacy technology really, you know, it's uh, we started this early uh, mid 2000s, really. Um, so in in technology, you know, it's like dog years. It's it's really old at this point. So um, what we do at Automation Hero is um, uh, very interesting and and uh, it's really fascinating to have the chance to be on that right again because it's you know. Being lucky enough to build an IPO candidate uh, once, that's great, you know, especially for like this new from Halle, but now uh, building yet another company that grows 100% quarter over quarter, like really, you know, within a few years, um, achieving, getting on that like um, path to IPO uh, is really fascinating. So we automating business processes. Um, mostly we are, um, bought by insurances. So uh, single insurance, AOK insurance, I can talk about these two in Germany, are, are customers. 
um, we have another very, 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 very big German insurance. I can't tell you, but you maybe can guess. So, and really across, you know, we have a whole bunch of US insurance customers and yeah, um, doing really well. What are we doing? We automating historically very slow manual business processes. So if you think, for example, you know, someone, uh, you know, parked their car and bumped, uh, bumped you yeah, and you want to get uh, the money back from the insurance. Um, it's quite a manual process because it works a lot with unstructured data. Yeah, yeah. You have the invoice for uh, renting a car, you have the invoice to um, uh, getting the car repaired. Um, maybe you need an evaluation for the car. Um, you know, you maybe have certain documents, a doctor's note, you know, what have you, that are all part of the process. So if you have a claim, it's very common that insurances pay 40% on top of the claim just to process that claim. Um, and again, it's a very labor intense manual process that's actually very error prone because uh, there's a lot of typing in data. It's like, okay, how much was the voice? Okay, let me type it in here and then let me type it into the other system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we automating these processes um, using um, deep learning or you know, a popular term of course is artificial intelligence. Um, we do a few things uh, much, much better than anybody else. Uh, for example, you give us an image and we can basically turn an image like an invoice into, um, into structured data from like unstructured image, literally like a smartphone picture. Maybe we can turn it into, into data that we can, of course, then feed into SAP, Salesforce, what have you, um, you know, whatever the business process needs. Uh, we can understand natural language. So for, um, the biggest logistic company, uh, I can't name it, but you can imagine as well. We're actually automating um, their coding. So if you write, hey, yeah. I would like to set the, uh, send a container from Beijing to San Francisco, um, you know, how much is that? Um, we can understand the intent of that email. Uh, we can extract then again from that unstructured data structure, such as origin, destination, amount, date, these kind of things. And then you know, pretty straightforward. You look things up in like an SAP and it's in a CRM system, what's the discount rate and so on. And then you can automatically answer this. So um, we are, of course, these um, automations uh, help is significant increase customer experience. Yeah, you turn around much faster. You know, we all hate to file a claim and need to wait six months until we get our money. So now we can turn around within hours, of course. Um, we can automate these codes within seconds before it took three and a half days. And what's interesting, really, there's a, there's a shift, right? So a lot of these companies um, really struggle to hire talent. You know, nobody in their 20s wakes up, oh, you know, I want to be uh, an insurance um, expert and do nothing else than looking at car voices every day. So it's actually really, really difficult to hire for these things. So automation, digitalization, of course, has this, um, negative karma some, or, or perspective that people are like, oh, you know, what's with the jobs? Well, the, the reality for many of these companies is they don't find people. That's why it takes six months. If they could, they would hire 200 people, but nobody wants to sit there and do nothing else than, you know, yeah, next invoice, let me type it in. Next invoice, let me type it in. So again, helps with efficiency, customer experience in overall um, kind of more standardized compliance business processes. So uh, um, it's interesting if you hear the name automation, automatization or automation hero, uh, you might think about uh, uh, big machines and so on. But these are service processes, right? Yeah, it's all, all business processes, usually in the front office, you know, again, quote processing, customer support, um, um, claims, uh, claims processing, um, just, you know, kind of the things that everybody hates to do, like, oh, here we go again, I have to look up the text ID of this person. So you can just, again, use AI to automate these things. And then help people just to focus on the interesting things, which is like, oh, this is actually insurance fraud, I want to dive into that. Yeah, Stefan, um, if you uh, look uh, three years back, um, your company was named Sales Hero. And now- yeah. it's Automa uh, automation hero. So yeah. why why this shift? I, I saw it when I've seen automation hero. Uh, you founded a new company, but it, it's still the same. But you have renamed it. What was the reason for this? Yeah. So so look, I mean, building a, 
who tells you he woke up or she woke up with the perfect idea for a startup and just built it. Um, maybe that happens once every 10 million situations. But what is very important if you build a company is really just optimizing on your learning cycle. And one of these learnings for us was people misperceive what we did, right? I mean, I woke up at 4 a.m. in the night um, and had this idea, oh, I call this company Sales Hero because we want to automate front office, mostly sales coding, you know, um, yeah. customer engaging processes. Um, but within a year we learned, uh, first of all, um, our customers started using our product, not just for front office automation, but also for back office automation. Yeah, mm -hmm. And they're like, why are you called sales hero? That doesn't make sense. We also do customer, you should call customer support hero or back office hero. So um, that was uh, the, the first learning. And, and then, you know, the other thing of course is people thought, Ooh, if it's sales here, it must be a CRM system. So you must be competitive to Salesforce or something like this. Okay. So, and it's, you know, I think it's important to just like, again, optimize on learning. Um, and then if you learn something, you know, just change it. So um, wasn't the best name pick. So we fixed it. We were lucky enough to get a trademark for Automation Hero and uh, we execute on it. And here we are. Great. Yeah, so thank you very much. And, and I would also activate all, uh, all of our guests here. If you have questions, please uh, write in the chat and then, then we will just introduce this um, in, in, into our discussion. Um, Stefan, uh, coming now from, from your experience and, and you are still, you have offices in, in Germany, right? Germany, UK, a whole bunch of US cities, yeah, Chicago, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. Is, is there still an office in, in Halle? There is right on the right on market uh, on the market. Yes, yeah. So, we have, um, and I also I, I saw my colleague Anil in the call. Hi, colleagues. <laughs> so um, yeah, we do have uh, we have an office in Halle, and um, yeah, we actively hiring. We're growing very quickly. So anybody uh, is listening in? Yeah, very, very interesting, uh, uh, Stefan. If we take this. And let's move uh, to the current situation, um, not only in Germany, not only in the US, it's worldwide. Yeah, we yeah. have the Corona pandemic um, situation and, um, and, um, and we know all, all of our guests here and, and, and you and I, uh, we are not through. We, we are in, 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 in the middle of this. And um, my question is, looking from Silicon Valley, uh, taking your perspective, um, first of all, um, what is the situation in Silicon Valley? Is, 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 is that an issue? Are you uh, attacked uh, by this? And the other uh, question is, if you look at business opportunities and business risk, so on which side do you, uh, or what is, uh, if you sleep at night, do you think about more risks of this corona, the implications of corona or more ch uh, 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 chances or, or challenges, so to say, yeah? And yeah, please. Um, well, so first of all, you know, it, it is very uh, devastating and um, we feel very sad for all the lives lost. And it's um, not wanna get political, but it is, you know, of course, from my perspective, being German and living in the US, seeing the two systems dealing with that very differently uh, and seeing the impact, uh, it's, it's a question of life or death. You know, that is uh, very um, saddening. It, it, it really, well, let me not just say sad, it makes me angry. Uh, um, how politically uh, misguided uh, the, some people behave, also, also in Germany, you know, it's not just a US problem, right? Mm -hmm. But how um, such a devastating situation is misused um, for political um, yeah, games and propaganda, really. So let me the say this up front. That the shutdown is necessary, or would, what would you think differently? Uh, or, oh, or? no, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, I mean, um, in the moment you, we, you know, we, we are humans. We um, have, we should have as number one priority um, 
humans and our pets and um, justifying any kind of business growth um, or justifying lives for business growth is absolutely devastating. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I even not necessarily following the argument because the, it is, um, I think it also is an opportunity. Yeah? It is an opportunity to, um, uh, in, look, I left to the wall coming down in East Germany. I did, uh, did change equals opportunity. Yeah? And it's, um, yes, it's very devastating for the travel industry. Um, but let's be also honest, if we, um, if we can buy 99 bucks flights to Egypt, uh, something is wrong. Yeah? It is just not environmentally sustainable to do these things. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, again, I, I believe very much in evolution. Yeah? And evolution is always testing complex ecosystems and then is um, sometimes painfully healing these. And, 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 and yes, I'm really sorry about the jobs that um, are falling out there, but I really believe that, again, there's a major shift. We can now do um, much more digital, right? So, I mean, we in Germany are absolutely behind um, with digital transformation. And, you know, I'm really, again, a lucky guy here, um, as so many times in my life. I happen to be in the uh, business of digital transformation. So it totally, the, the, the crisis totally drives our business. We see more business than ever before, yeah? Um, and, and again, it's easy to say from my lucky mm. position here. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I think really um, change is an opportunity. And yes, um, something is destroyed, but there's also um, maybe a correction in the market uh, that is necessary. I think there's, you know, the way I always describe this is if you, if you build a business, you have to think about you, you want to sell a vitamin pill, you know, a nice to have, or do you want to build a painkiller? Yeah. And I don't mean this in the pharmaceutical negative way and there's a lot of misuse of painkillers, but I really mean is that business value, true business value. And I think a crisis like this is shaking, shaking this out quite a lot. Right. And um, again, there's a lot of, um, at least what I see in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of companies that we are artificially blown up that of course now deflate um, and it's, it is a healthy situation from that context. Right. Um, uh, in, in, in Germany, it's, it's, it's discussed that, that we, have, um, we have seen a lot of weaknesses. So the crisis has just um, uh, gave us um, um, view on the weaknesses and 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 uh, I think um, looking at digitalization in Germany um, there are a lot of weaknesses looking at schools looking at hospitals looking at uh, official institutions uh, uh, and so on and so on you you know both sides you know um, uh, the US you know uh, this cluster Silicon Valley and uh, then you come back to Germany. So, um, do, do do you have also this uh, this feeling that Germany is really lagging behind? So, for our size, for our um, economic power, we we have to reinvest. We have to reallocate budgets, especially for the, for the future growth. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, but first of all, it's not black and white. You know, it's not all terrible. I think companies are aware of that. They're pushing on it. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, yeah, you, sometimes you would be surprised if you see a, a telephone pull in Silicon Valley where, you know, you have like this uh, thousand knots of cables coming out. You're like, wait, this is, this is Silicon Valley here, you know, and then you knock on the walls and it's all um, just try wrong. Um, so he has a lot of really good things in Germany, right? The mm -hmm. kind of the values and the way we build things is more sustainable and long term and this and that. But again, there's this notion of um, Moore's law that I'm very behind, which is this acceleration of innovation, right? And if you go all the way to like Kurzweil and um, um, in his theories about, uh, about that, um, we really need to catch up. And I see the right movements. We're just not catching up fast enough. Yeah? We, we're just not 100% behind it. And, um, you know, again, I hope that this, this crisis also is an opportunity for us to really see we 
uh, have to invest now to be stronger. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is not the last coronavirus or the last potential pandemic that is coming. With the amount of people we have, you know, in cities together, with the globalization, with the quick travel, anything like this can happen again. And um, look, if we have more devastating um, viruses, you know, Ebola uh, outbreak or anything like this, this could be way, 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 way worse. And again, I'm not want to play small the devastating times we have. But I, I really hope that um, there's a lot of learnings in here and that we need, to, we need to accelerate. And it's on us, on our generation, really. You know, we can't just wait, oh, the next generation on this and that, right? We really need to set the foundation now and we need to execute mm -hmm. it. If anything, then we just need to, like, move fast and be more pragmatic. We, as the German, you know, economy will make mistakes. And that's where we need to kind of get over ourselves. You know, we, we're trying to be perfect, right? We, we don't sell a car that doesn't have the perfect sound when you close the door. It doesn't matter anymore, right? So um, you see how other car manufacturers are outperforming the Germans these days. Um, and everybody laughed about them just like five years ago. So we really need to step up, you know, be humble. We can't be just arrogant and like, oh, we're really strong in this and that. That's what the Roman Empire thought about themselves as well. And by the way, that's, that's what the Americans said. And, you know, they're on the brink of civil unrest right now. So it's, it is a very fragile and we need to invest and accelerate. Um, Stefan, and, uh, I, I think there's a question from Philip. Is that right? Yeah, but I ask um, my colleague Fisher, Mrs. Fisher. Yes, uh, hello. Um, I'm, I'm going to read out the first question, actually. There came one question. Uh, Stefan, um, it's asking, you're talking about using machine learning to optimize processes. Does that mean that there is less need to save data in a structured way, or do you rather see machine learning as a way to provide interfaces to structured databases slash get rid of manual data entry? Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, the uh, AI capabilities, or again, that's the popular term, right? Machine learning, deep learning, um, whatever term you want to use for that, are uh, um, in an accelerating um, pace getting better. Uh, in fact, OpenAI was, well, by the way, also an organization that um, Elon Musk founded, that just published a research paper a couple of weeks ago. They found that um, AI models, algorithms, machine learning algorithms are um, accelerating faster than Moore's law, actually by two months, right? So Moore's law every 18 months have their capacity or mm -hmm. capabilities doubling. So they found that uh, machine learning is actually doubling their performance every 16 months. So and again, the, yeah, so and, and for human, um, exponential growth is really hard uh, to grasp because we just live linearly. Uh, but of course, we now had to live to this crisis because of exponential, exponential and viral growth. Um, and again, here, technology is accelerating exponentially or virally, whatever term you want to use. So, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We are specifically using machine learning to extract structured data from unstructured. And what's interesting, of course, the world is unstructured. Yeah, If I engage with my insurance or with my you know, with my bank, it's unstructured because I use language. That's by definition unstructured, right? It's not that I say birth, 77, gender, male, right? So we like, hey, I'm born in 1977, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, machine learning is getting much, much better working with unstructured data than extracting the structured data, putting that into the business system that require uh, structured data. And then of course, machine learning can use structured data to do um, prediction, right? So risk prediction around, for example, insurance fraud or anything like this. So yeah, that's exactly what we do. Um, and uh, I hope that answered the question, Philip. Thank you very much. There's actually another question right here and I'm going to read it out to you. Please. As data expert, how do you see the US in general and the Silicon Valley in specific after the COVID-19? Keeping in mind the US politics, election, Trump, the ongoing protests, China war, oil prices, Russia, and maybe even more things to come. What do you think? That's a loaded question. Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, 
you know, as if you live long enough in, in the United States, especially in business conversation, you always try to steer clear of, uh, of politics, right? But um, look, I grew up in East Germany in a communist country. I saw um, a demonstration as something extremely powerful to change my life to the better. Yeah, so I very much believe in democratic processes um, in, and part of democratic processes uh, to, to go to the streets or uh, um, yeah, really get engaged in the political process, uh, which I extensively did um, when I was younger. You know, so I definitely organized demonstrations such my hometown as, uh, as I was in the um, actually, Landesschülervertretung, I'm not sure how to translate it into English, in the um, student government council for, for the state. So anyhow, I really much believe in this. Um, so uh, look, I think there's a really interesting situation here. Yeah? The, um, the prominent position that the United States historically had given a true, a very strong economy, that financed a lot of their, you know, political uh, power globally, um, is not on um, on such a solid foundation as it used to be. And I think there's an opportunity, specifically for Europe, to take a leadership role here in a really good way because Europe is, uh, you know, by definition more. You know, it's a union, right? We, I'm not saying we um, diverse by color necessarily. We're all kind of white Europeans, to be honest. But, you know, I mean, the German, the French, the Brits, we were all in, in the Spanish and so on and so on. We all came together here, really. And I think hopefully that is, again, um, um, as I believe very strongly in diversity, an opportunity to build a very strong, um, um, you know, political construct that could take a leadership role and hopefully a leadership role that is more peaceful, yeah, more thoughtful, more forward thinking. Mm -hmm. Topics such as um, uh, global warming are very important. And it seems, again, that um, Europe, you know, is not as far as I would like to see it. Yeah? I, I do have solar, I drive electric car. Uh, I'm not just talking about it, but the um, I think the opportunity really is there to maybe change a little bit the future outcome here um, in a positive way, right? And hopefully um, very quickly, at least uh, in fall this year, the U.S. kind of comes back to sanity, you know, and, um, and then I think maybe we're all a little bit more on eyesight and hopefully can tackle the real problems we have um, on on this um, on this small planet that we all live on. Right. Uh, um, Stefan, uh, there are other questions, and Mrs. Fisher will just inject them um, in a minute. Um, but uh, m maybe there is something which is interesting, um, and all of our alumni know that we have the cooperation with the Harvard Business School with Michael Porter's Institute. And Michael Porter will publish a book, a new book. And, and, and he wrote an email and he, he was um, to colleagues and, and, and he was saying that might be his most important book. And we know Michael Porter is a guy who is uh, um, cluster analysis, uh, competitive yeah. advantage and all these things. And the book is called, and I can deliver if you're interested in this, I, I can deliver it to, to all of you, all of our guests also. It's, it's called um, Industry Politics. And he, he, he's seeing uh, 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 risk because uh, if you have not a democracy anymore, uh, and, and if, 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 if you are not agile, if, 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 if you are uh, holding the status quo, right? Uh, or if you have two big parties and, 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 and uh, so uh, it's very interesting and I'm looking forward to what, what uh, he's writing. So people from business move in now or they try to bridge uh, uh, or they, they try to look where is the link between models which we have in economics and, and taking this uh, to the political situation. So I think this is very interesting. Yeah. So we should all see what Michael Porter will just present us. This is just uh, um, supporting your argument that we should look for democratic uh, processes, right? 
Yeah. It, and, and it's, I really strongly believe in that across the spectrum, right? We need um, monopolies in politics or in industry or in medication or in, um, how do I say that? You know, let me phrase it in the opposite way. What's really important is diversity, you know. In our, um, in our small company, it's diversity is important. In our country, diversity is important. In our economy, diversity is important. If we just have you know, one group dominating or one company dominating or one party dominating, it's usually a centralization of power is um, maybe, maybe I read too much Karl Marx uh, as, a, as a East German, right? But um, I believe in that diversity across all the different spectrums. Right, right, right. Ms. Fischer, we have, I, I think we have still... Yes. Uh, yeah. There's more questions coming in. Um, I'm just going to read the next one. Uh, thank you for your elaboration, first of all. Um, so when considering your experience as a founder, what have been the biggest challenges and pitfalls when founding your first companies and how did you manage to overcome those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very fundamental. Um, Look, I mean, I had no clue what I did, right? I just did it. Um, and uh, that might have been a good thing because I basically just run into every single mistake you potentially can do, right? And um, with that, I learned, you know, I think if, if there was anything, then, um, you know, I'm um, um, in German, a Dickkopf, um, you know, <laughs> Maybe politically stubborn. correct, I would say, yeah, stubborn or pers perseverant. Um, uh, but yeah, look, I, I made every every possible mistake, and um, if you make so many mistakes, you just get to the point like, yeah, screw that up, learn something, let's move on. And again, this is a this is maybe something a little un-German because we always try to be super perfect, yeah, uh, in everything, and we grown up is like, oh, you know. Um, this is how you have to put the silver beer on the, on the table and this is how you have to make your bed and what have you. But the, um, the opportunity really rise through the speed of learning and that's the key. Uh, the, the, again, I believe in this evolution, also in the context of startups, uh, try something and we really institutionalize that in this company. Uh, we're really in every, we do our agile marketing, we do agile sales, we do agile product development, of course, where we have really institutionalized, okay, we do uh, sprints, yeah? we learn something, we do retrospectives, we are extremely data-driven, so we measure what works, what doesn't work, and really institutionalize these this learning cycles. Um, and uh, then, you know, when we learn something, we um, trying uh, and, and really investing this as a small startup, we actually have a rather sizable education team, what are professional educators, to then share the learnings within the organization. So it's all about speed of learning and then sharing the learning. Um, and again, that, that happened because I was stubborn and made every possible mistake, but eventually I think made us stronger as a company or as companies before. Stefan, I, I, I will just inject also two questions from my side. First of all, and and this is interesting. If 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 you would read some of your articles and, and you have a blog. Uh, or I have read some articles, it's very interesting to see that uh, maybe a quote like this here, um, the industry has long claimed that to leverage your data assets, you should hire a CDO. Um, but that's not a necessary investment on the parts to becoming a data-driven business. In fact, um, it may be even um, contradicted. Um, so uh, this, this is interesting to see because I know a lot of companies that say, wow, we, we will hire a CDO and, and he's responsible for, for this. Um, uh, are you still this, uh, is this still your meaning uh, about a CDO? Do you have a CDO in your company? No, no. So it comes back to what I said before, right? So if you if you centralize, so I believe in again this democratization, even of things such as data driven decision making in organizations. If you look at to you know pick any kind of medium or larger company, um, what I think is the battle strategy is to again I believe in this evolution kind of theory, yeah, is to democratize all the business business departments and allow them to make data-driven decisions. So it's more a question of empower them 
and let them learn themselves and iterate because maybe these guys learn this and these guys learn this. If you centralize something like this, first of all, now you have a bottleneck, right? You have just one team, one, uh, one woman, one man that, that runs the organization. So again, your learning slows down. You have a centralization of power. Um, and, um, and therefore, maybe the wins, but also the failures will just spread across the company. I can I give you a quick example. We worked with an unnamed German car company, yeah, and we uh, we made a free POC with them in their car manufacturing in Russia. We proved that we can improve their car uh, production efficiency by something like twelve percent. I forgot the exact number, but insane, right? So basically, whatever we made, we just showed you we can make fifty million dollars more for this factory. And they had a very centralized structure, very typically German hierarchically, right? So, well, you know, this was maybe luck. So we did two more POCs, all of the time of the small company in Brazil and in the US, we proved it again. So now we're already a year in, right? So meanwhile, they could have made $50 million more already on the first uh, factory. Um, so then, you know, oh, this is really great. We can do this globally. Well, if we do this really globally, we should bring in T systems. And these systems really can then like do this professionally and roll it out. So long story short, um, five years later, they still don't do what we did, uh, did to them. And again, because the, the, hierarch, um, the hierarchy and the speech in which they move because everything is centralized, um, um, just absolutely was in the way. We, are, we worked with other companies that um, again, did set up the whole process differently. And this is true for everything, right? Also for automation right now. Instead of like doing the centralized, what is a very typical, you know, instant reaction for companies. Oh, we need to create a center of excellence. Um, and then, you know, we, we spend maybe $100,000 less on the software we buy because we buy it for the whole company. Uh, I think that's really a mistake. I think um, you should um, empower, um, yeah, different parts of the organization. You know, there's some technology requirements. These systems need to talk to each other. This, but you can all solve that, right? So that's kind of you need to establish, like, okay, what's the protocol? What's the what's the foundation here? But I really believe if you empower the different business units, they just are more agile, more faster, more learning, okay. then can cross pollinate itself, and 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 therefore moving faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting to hear. And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm looking to Mrs. Fisher. I, I think we have more questions and um, we have uh, still spent one, one hour. So time is <laughs> running fast, yeah. And, yeah, there's, actually, uh, there's yeah. actually one question kind of going in line with, with, with what you've already said uh, with your upbringing. So the question is, how did you personally overcome this very German tendency to strive for perfection, but instead to act quickly and not to miss out on opportunities, particularly in the current context? You kind of, went along for that, but maybe go in more depth, uh, if you may. Yeah, um, um, you know, it's really, be, first of all, you have to be conscious about that, right? So congratulations um, to the person that asked if you're already realizing you are perfectionist. You know, I don't know, find yourself a hobby where you can um, feed that part of, you know, uh, of, of, of your passion. Um, go into uh, baking croissants, I tell you, uh, it's very, very difficult. There you can develop perfectionism. And then, uh, and then you know, it's, it's very simple tools um, that are out there and you can read about this. There's books such as Getting Things Done or, um, you know, um, Sprint is another interesting book for just these like more agile processes. And what is interesting, if you're truly interested to achieve the perfect result, then you will find after practicing some of these more agile um, approaches that you will get to better results. That's the interesting thing. Yeah? And look, I mean, look at the most complex system that exists on the planet, which is a human being. I mean, think about this. Over millions of years, we perfected biochemistry to a point where we hear on a, on a computer that's human created talking you know, across the planet with each other. Like just, this is like the most complex and most perfect thing this planet ever uh, brought, brought out, uh, you could argue. And how did it, how was it created? You know, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes who's religious, but I believe, I, I personally believe that it was an evolutionary process. Yeah? 
um, the uh, you know environment tested something out, stress tested it. You know we don't have dinosaurs anymore. It seems like this approach didn't work out, um, and now again we improved, improved, improved. So I think if you if you go for very quick iteration cycles consistently. Um, stress test your ideas, your processes, measure it, improve, learn, improve, learn, um, you get to better results. There's a couple interesting movies where this is, of course, used in the sports world, um, you know, incremental improvements in, for example, how the Sky, um, the, 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 the British cycling team, and of course, I got in trouble doing doping as well, but um, yeah, some really interesting um, research where, you know, they didn't say, okay, there's this one thing we can do better, but we just tune every little thing and improve by 2% week over week. And then of course, eventually you get to, to much better results. Mm -hmm. Another good movie is, um, sorry, I do a little self plug here. Um, Personal Gold, also a nice little movie about uh, consistent incremental improvements. Yeah. Hey, Stefan, a, a short question from my side here. You live in S Silicon Valley. Um, as as a German entrepreneur, and uh, I think your wife is from the U.S., so you have uh, conversations to, uh, at home. Um, uh, um, please please let me know in Silicon Valley. We you have uh, different uh, people, leaders, inventors, and so on. And what we um, what we know that the the cross functional or the the, the, the interaction or the conversation between disciplines um, seems to be easier in Silicon Valley. There are not so wa so high walls between the disciplines. Um, uh, what what is your feeling about conversations? Do we have clusters of people and they stick together and then they share ideas and then this is a closed shop? Or, or, or are there other formats or what, 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 give us an insight. So, so how, yeah. how do you make conversations or is it online or do you have personal meetings or parties or what, how is that? Yeah, yeah I call it the Silicon Valley laundry machine, wash machine. So um, there's, a, there's, there's good and bad, right? So what is interesting, uh, average time of people in Silicon Valley staying in companies is two years. So what you consistently have is cross-pollination, right? The one person that worked for Google now works for Twitter and then worked for Uber. And then so if you actually deassemble the technology stack of all these companies that have a different business model, but actually the tech stack is always the same. You know, they have some big data under the hood, they have some machine learning here, this and that, right? And again, it doesn't matter. Uber, Airbnb, pick your favorite company here. So, um, I think what they really ahead of in compare, especially to Germany is that is that exchange, yeah? Uh, in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, I think you have over 3,000 meetup groups where people meet and exchange ideas. Um, and yes, you sign in your agreement, your non-disclosure and confidentiality agreement and so on here. So people not necessarily uh, going and distributing the uh, grown, uh, crown jewels of intellectual property. Um, but there's a lot of experience sharing, and I think that again accelerates the learning and brings uh, brings folks forward. And I think the other thing that's really interesting about Silicon Valley it is the diversity. Um, you know, if you meet someone that was born and raised in San Francisco, you're like, wait, you from here? You grew up here? You here your whole life? Um, you know, I would say the big majority of people here. Uh, they, they grew up somewhere else, you know, might be in other parts of the US, might be other parts of um, of the world where, you know, you easily have, you know, half of the people here coming from other countries. And by the way, 51% of CEOs um, um, of unicorns in Silicon Valley are immigrants. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important also to understand uh, for, for, for Germans, yeah. Uh, and there's a um, if you read the book uh, Tipping Point, I think um, it really explains why people with, you know, a challenged background, you know, have more perseverance and, you know, be able to excel in these careers. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's this, uh, it's this laundry machine of consistently conversations and exchanging mm -hmm. uh, ideas and knowledge and building personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The laundry uh, machine method. So that's in interesting. 
Um, I have. I, I was, <laughs> you know, I call it laundry machine because I would always put my colored shirts in with my white shirts and then my white shirts have a different color, right? So. <laughs> Interesting. Ms. Fischer, do, do, do we have additional yeah. questions? Otherwise, yeah, there's we another question, actually. Last, our last uh, point uh, to talk, yeah? There's one question for you, Professor Kirsch Georg, uh, mm -hmm. and that is how do you see consumer behavior changing due to the pandemic? Oh, that's an interesting question, and and now we will see more um, more um, um, studies coming up. Uh, we've had uh, yesterday uh, uh, a sprint uh, session mm -hmm. on um, designing a framework for um, consumer study. We will we will do uh, during the next uh, two months, and. Um, um, maybe one or two phenomena, and Stefan, uh, we can maybe reflect this with uh, what's going on in the US. What we see in Germany is the so called one stopping phenomenon is back. Okay. And this has, has a huge impact. That means you, you want only to stop once, and, and, and then you, you buy everything, and, and then you move at home. And this means that a lot of specialty stores, um, uh, drug stores, uh, and other stores, they have really problems. And um, the, the traditional, um, in, in, in Germany, Kaufland, uh, oder, oder uh, auch, auch Warenhäuser, uh, haben Vorteile. And so this one-stop shopping phenomenon, this is very, very interesting. And, um, and um, we will see the budget shifts between online and also offline. Um, it's 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 interesting, yeah. Um, and and the and and the issue brands, brands. If people are in situations and they are if they are not sure what to do, they 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 want to have orientation. Traditional brands get more attention at the moment. This is very interesting. And so companies, um, big companies, which we all know, they uh, now invest more in traditional brands again. It's very interesting. And new brands, they have a little bit of a hard job, right? Uh, Stefan, is there a re reaction from your side or? Totally, totally see that. I mean, especially two things, especially in the US are totally driving or underlining what you just said. Uh, obviously pandemic and, um, you know, extended shelter at home orders. Yeah, so everything is going online. Um, I mean, again, it's, uh, it, it drives monopoly of one specific online retailer that we all know. Uh, that's concerning, but of course it's extremely convenient. They did an extraordinary good job to make it really easy to buy stuff very quickly, yeah, and to build a platform. So I agree that there's, I, I'm not having a lot of hope for specialty stores in the future, you know, online or um, in, in the physical world. And of course, right now in the US, given the unrest um, it's even worse for these small mom and pop stores. What is again totally sad, um, but of course the writing was on the wall for the last 20 years, right? So if you had a gift card store the last 10 years and think that this will be good business for the rest of your life, then again, it's, it's, it's very important to understand how quickly society shifts and changes. Right. Uh, and I feel for the people that own it, um, but if you zoom out, it, it, the writing is on the wall very, very clearly. What is fascinating for me, though, in the context of brands, is the political um, work, impact, and statements companies do. You know, we in the U.S. are at the point, uh, think about that, we're at the point that we... Um, so concerned about the political environment that big brands um, use their ad dollars to make uh, statements. And we can discuss that, right? You might, yeah. They say, oh, we spend a million dollars on Black Lives Matter, but then they spend $10 million on doing the ads uh, in the TV, or you, know, you could argue it's not the right thing. But um, it is very fascinating to see that uh, brands take a political stand and um, yeah. yeah, trying to do what is right. 
Uh, very, very interesting developments. So I hope we have uh, answered this question. Uh, the additional there's actually, question. there's an actually a follow-up yeah. question on that topic, and that is: Is the shift to a one-stop shop solution and, and strong brands the major reason for the winner takes it all businesses? And can differentiation or niche strategies still stop that trend in the future? What do you, both of you, think? Mm -hmm. Manfred, that's your area of expertise. Yeah. I uh, maybe there's, there's also one trend and, and this is closely linked with this global uh, pandemic phenomenon or crisis that uh, people think again in, in, in regional um, uh, terms. So the re region comes back. And, um, and, and, and what we also see, um, some of you might know from our guests that we do research in, uh, in the field of uh, trade shows. So these, these big events where uh, um, 10,000 or 100,000 people meet for one week uh, here in Leipzig and Hanover, uh, uh, Düsseldorf and so on. And Germany is uh, uh, world leading in, 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 in this type of service. Um, so we have, Different phenomena and 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 uh, which which uh, which are now they they overlap, and 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 we have to see what will be the the outcome of this. It's 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 really hard, and um, uh, we have seen a lot of crisis. And after the crisis, people switch back to the old behavior, and uh, but but uh, more and more, and we have to do now uh, research about this more. Um, there is a deep movement uh, within human beings, um, and the reason for that is that they rethink, uh, due to the pandemic uh, phenomenon, um, do we live in the in the right style, um, and and so on and so on. So sorry, I I think I have switched a little bit <laughs> uh, broader here, um, but we re uh, regional uh, by regional products by brands and if, if, if they cover regional products wonderful and and also one-stop shopping in the region and and so on um yeah but also online is, is is moving forward it's booming also online is booming and and amazon is uh, is winning it's 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 no 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 question amazon is winning immense immense yeah um, Stefan, um, uh, uh, well, oh, we have covered more or less uh, our time. Do we have, have some minutes for, for closing for, for sure? Yeah. Yes, of course. There's no more questions. So if anybody's still out there having any questions, okay. please type and them in right now. Otherwise, um, I guess they want to do. And, and, and still we have a lot of uh, guests here. Uh, Stefan, let me just uh, close with a discussion on five minutes or, or a little bit uh, longer on. Um, and 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 I know you are very engaged also if you if you are in Germany um, to give recommendation to to um, startups to to founders. So please um, uh, uh, try to do uh, uh, this or this uh, without arrogance. So so. If, if, if you should give recommendations, and I look at our um, spin lab and, and others, so what might be general recommendations for moving forward with uh, new businesses, new business models, and so on? Yeah, um, so I think it's a great time to start a company. Um, and I started my last company in a crisis uh, as well. So for, for multiple reasons, I mean, of course, you need to see if you can, if you can make it happen. Do you have the savings? Do you, is it the right time in your life, right? So if you, if you just started a family and, you know, your husband has to stay at home, I'm not sure if, if you want to start a company right now. So you have to figure this out. Is it the right time in your life? Um, yeah, to start a company, can you afford it and not just financially, also mentally, because it's the hardest thing from a business perspective you can do. But if, if you get to that conclusion, now is, a, I think, a great time because change, as I said, is opportunity. You know, um, I saw it again when the wall came down. I saw it in the last crisis. I see it in this crisis. Because this change will create business opportunity. Yeah? Um, we will have to 
rethink we, the behavior of the consumer is changing. Yeah, this is an opportunity to jump on and maybe offering something um, that um, is feeding these new needs or these new um, you know, requirements, uh, if it's in a consumer or in a maybe enterprise world. Um, you know, there will be a correction in the market around certain prices. A lot of companies will have to compete really hard to get your business, what will drive down uh, your cost to really run a business. Yeah? It will drive down the cost of employment. You know, you will have in this crisis the opportunity to hire talent that maybe a year ago you couldn't afford or that didn't even want to take the risk, but now basically they, they lost their job. So I think there's a lot of things, again, that um, provide an opportunity. What is critical, though, is, um, you know, you will, you will get maybe less money um, and you will... You, you, you have to prove faster value, but I think that's really healthy. So mm -hmm. what of course I see in Silicon Valley a lot is that there's insane amount of money pumped into, um, into companies that shouldn't get you know, that amount of money. And you know, again, it's, uh, the market is, is very hot. You have a meaningful business, you're making money. That means you will be able to attract investors. Don't expect to attract investors based on your idea. You know, that's, I think, one of the big mistakes that entrepreneurs always think, oh, I have this major idea, and if I can just talk to this guy, uh, who will understand my vision, my idea, I will get a lot of money and can build this. No, no, start small. Prove you can do it. Build something, you know, even if it's incomplete, where people are willing to pay you money for. Mm -hmm. um, again, the, the most healthiest way is to bootstrap a company as much as you can. And again, that's easy said for me. I raised a lot of capital, but believe me, you know, for the first 15 years of my life, I bootstrapped every single company. Um, and, you know, I literally lived in an, in an apartment in Germany. I paid 30 bucks and I didn't pay the, the, the power bill every month because I couldn't afford it. So I, mm -hmm. I really you know, I have the dirt under my fingernails. Um, now it's easy, you know, I'm on the other side, but um, the healthiest thing is really to prove business value or value for the customers and make people pay. And right now it's very hard time, you know, um, but that helps you to focus. You know, it doesn't get you distracted, doesn't get you the million dollars, but maybe with this like 10,000 euros you still have on your bank account, you just, you can be, you have to be extraordinarily focused and just get it done. Um, and what, what's in, one thing is interesting, maybe it's the right thing to, you know, keep your job a little longer and just make sure your idea is right, right? So maybe on the weekends, on the nights, you have to build something and it's not mean you have to code it, but um, you know, things such as Upwork where you can get a developer somewhere in the world for 15 bucks an hour. Yeah, it's not a problem these days. And just really make sure that you build this painkiller uh, and not a vitamin pill. Not, oh, this would be cool, but a painkiller means people are, they see what you did and instantly willing to pay you money because it's so valuable to them. Right. Stefan, change is an opportunity. Chance, uh, ch change is an opportunity. I, I, I think this, uh, this is, uh, this is this, um, a typical statement of a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> And, uh, and um, I, I think uh, we have to invite you physically to HHL and you were already uh, uh, a lot of times here and, and it's always wonderful to have you here and it's fascinating and, and we can talk, I, I know about hours about, about your core business. <laughs> so there is a lot, a lot uh, to talk about more. And so um, I might hand over an invitation to you next time. Uh, it would be wonderful to see you here at HHL. And um, um, also, I would like to thank all of you. I, I see still over 60 members here in, in, in this virtual room. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I think this is an idea that we try to get in conversation uh, to you without uh, a lot of transaction costs from Silicon Valley to Germany or vice versa. So uh, therefore it's the idea, the expert talk, the HHL expert talk should uh, bring us closer together and share some ideas and sorts and, 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 and so on. Um, 
I would uh, also deliver some information, maybe Michael Porter spoke and, and uh, uh, Stefan, if you have also uh, uh, interesting recommendations sometimes, uh, then we can just also deliver this to our guests, which were here in this virtual room. And uh, I would uh, finally uh, say bye bye and hand over to um, uh, Ms. Fisher, maybe you want also to yes. um, close the session. Yes, uh, thank you so much, both of you, for your time and for all those insights. Stefan, especially, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, all your knowledge. I think it was very, very helpful for everybody out there who is either already uh, founding or is interested in doing that. So thank you for your time. Also, Professor Kwesh-Georg. And um, also thank you to all of you who um, tuned in tonight.